Hey there, everybody. Welcome to my channel, The Magical Solution. My name is Leilani, and this is our first live back here in 2022, uh, 2023. And I'm really, really excited because for our first live, I have an amazing guest. Her name is Mona Sobani, and she is the author of Proof of Spiritual Phenomenon, a neuroscientist's discovery of the ineffable mysteries of the universe. Now, when I say this book is jam-packed with information, I'm not kidding. Um, she really, like, tonight we're really going to get to know Mona. And tonight we're going to get to know her story and we're going to know, you know, her research and everything that she went through. But in this book, I mean, it goes into pretty, pretty good detail with regards to this research. And I just know for a fact that the listeners tonight and the audience that normally watches my live will definitely relate to Mona and to her story. So let's get to know her a little bit, a little bit of her background. Mona Sobani, uh, she is a PhD in cognitive neuroscientist and holds a doctorate from the University of Southern California. And she completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Vanderbilt University with the MacArthur Foundation Law and Neuroscience Project. A former research scientist at the University of Southern California, she also was a scholar with the Sachs Institute for Mental Health Law, Policy, and Ethics, and her work has been featured in the New York Times, Vox, and other social media outlets. And of course, she currently resides in Los Angeles, California. So without further ado, let's bring her on. Hey there. <laughs> oh, you're muted. Let's get you. Oh, muted. there we go. Hi. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think I left it on mute. Hey. How are you? <laughs> Good and happy new year. <laughs> happy new year, of course. Thank you so much for being a guest on my show and specifically for being the very first guest of the new year. I was so honored and excited um, when I reached out to your publicist and I said, hey, can I please talk to this person? And she's like, yeah, of course. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to be here. So this book, I'm gonna sit up. Proof mm -hmm. of Spiritual Phenomenon. This is a buttload. There's a lot of stuff in here. But before we get into the book itself, let's just start with you. Like, who is Mona? Like, you know, what, where did you come from? What is your cultural and religious background, if any, um, that led you to neuroscience and then eventually, uh, you know, through what you've been through? So, like, let's start from the beginning. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm Persian. My cultural heritage is Persian. My parents are from, both of them are from Iran. They came here before the revolution, but um, the Islamic revolution that happened in Iran in 1978, for those who don't know. Um, and yeah, we're, we're, my mom's spiritual, my dad's not really, um, I didn't grow up with any, you know, my parents were very like, um, open to us believing whatever we wanted to believe. So they never forced anything on, on us or yeah. um, their opinions or anything on us. So we, I, I wasn't very, I wasn't very spiritual or religious. Um, when I was like 12, I think I sat and thought about um, religion and I was like, that doesn't make any sense. And I just kind of <laughs> abandoned it. I don't know. Um, with my 12 year old reasoning. And then um I was curious about the the universe and I was curious about humans and why we, we behave the way that we do. So that's why I ended up going into neuroscience because I wanted to understand what drives human behavior and, you know, how do we, how and why do we interact with each other the way, in the ways that we do. So, um, and I think I was, I think I was pretty curious about like from a, I wouldn't say metaphysical, but just like a universal perspective also, like not just our neuro, you know, not just the way our brains drive us, but are there other factors? Um, so I feel like at the beginning of graduate school, I was very curious about that, or, you know, I was always interested in coincidences and um, things that seem to happen that don't have 
explanations from science. Mm -hmm. But by the time I finished my training, um, I was, I, they, they train you. I mean, they beat it out of you. <laughs> they really train <laughs> you to, to be like a, a hard nosed, um, a skeptical person and somebody who, you know, needs evidence, um, and a, a very specific kind of evidence. So like, like, you know, quantified thing, right. measurable, um, evidence. And so, and they, uh, I, I don't think anyone ever tells you this, what it, but in, our schooling, it's just kind of the way it is in the Western worldview, is that they believe the universe is without meaning, that it's a dead and random place. And that's how we model, that's how we pursue science, that's how we uh, model everything that we do. Um, and so by the end of graduate school, I think I, you kind of, to feel like you earn those three letters at the end of your name, you end up subscribing to that worldview as well. And you just, everyone around you speaks as though that's the truth. So you end up adopting that too. So that's how I, that's kind of my story. And then I, yeah, yeah I was never, I was actually kind of anti-spiritual and anti-religious by the time I finished graduate school, because um, I, just the way they train you makes you think that it's completely illogical to believe in those mm. things. And so then I would get frustrated with people and be like, I don't understand why you would believe in something like that when you have science. Um, you know, so. <laughs> no, I feel of you. Course. I feel like I remember, you know, being in college and you and I are completely different. I don't have a PhD and I'm nowhere near as smart, but um, I remember like, you know, taking that first, you know, psych class, you know, you get alert, you get to learn a little bit about some Carl Jung and some, some occult information about a lot of these like early psychologists and fathers of psychology. And yeah. next thing you know, you're down a rabbit hole. Um, and it's interesting because the two fields, neuroscience and psychology, you would think that they would work really closely together, but there's actually quite a bit divide between those yeah. two fields yeah. of study and i'm wondering did anything specific like happen to you either in college or after college that made you stop and be like oh, wait a second let me <laughs> let me look into this a little bit more um yeah well i tell the story in the book of um do you mean in general like around that time i mean before yeah. that there was you know, things here like and there. Little things, yeah. Yeah, like I was curious, but but was there um, ever like a mon monumental moment or or anything like that? Just that. Um, well, in college, I was really obsessed with coincidences, and actually, recently, I found this really old. I was going, I was home for the holidays, and I was uh, at my parents' house going through old stuff, and I found this old journal from college, and. Um, I apparently was tracking coincidences and I, and I don't really remember doing, I mean, I sort of remember that I was really interested in them, but I don't, I didn't remember writing them down in detail, but I, I did for a few instances that were really big, like meta coincidences <laughs> and I can't, and I wish I could remember, I, cause I just read them quickly and moved on, but it was something like, you know, I, would mention some like obscure movie to my friend and she like was staring at me weirdly because she's like that's so weird that you brought that up because I watched that last night like at this random person's house and <laughs> um and then and then the two of us would have another coincidence with regard to that movie and it was like some really obscure movie so it wasn't something like uh, you know that you would expect to encounter in your everyday life so I had a number of those in college that apparently were weird enough that I wrote them down. Um, and I think that those kind of made me curious to be, to, you know, in a look at this reality that we live in and just kind of wonder, you know, like, what is it? Um, is it statistics? And I think that is the kind of thing that when I went into neuroscience, I was interested with statistics because I was like, okay, so how do we explain these? Is it just that they seem really improbable to us, but that they're actually totally statistically probable um, right. and you can explain it away like I didn't know. So yeah, I would say that those kind of made me curious, but um, the uh, there was like a series of events in a time in my life that kicked off all of this like later, much, much later um, that caused me to write the book and have all this transformation. And well, and I would love to get into that for sure. I love that you, you know, 
because I teach, I, you know, I, I'm coming from a spiritual sp perspective and I have students with regards to a lot of spiritual topics. And one of the things that I always encourage is journaling, right? Because these little synchronicities that you're talking about here, they are so easily missed. They are mm -hmm. so easily overlooked. They're so easily pushed aside as, oh, you know, just coincidence. Um, but to take those very... Um, mindful moments to really like look at your day, evaluate your day, analyze your day and write things down that seem a little off. I think it's just so imperative because you're right when it comes to being able to quantify something, right? You know, neuroscience, just science in general, it is it's about stats, it's about numbers, it's about crunching those numbers. But when you look at the synchronicities in terms of like global human and like global metaphysical experience, who's to say that those numbers are a lot farther in distance than than the stats that you would see with a mouse that's in a in a cage doing something over and over and over again in a very right. short period of time. So I'm I'm curious to find out for you from this book, what was your purpose of the book? Was your purpose to quantify and prove like God or spirit? Or was your purpose to try and find quantifiable research with regards to coincidences or something else entirely? Yeah, um, good question. I think that my, no, I mean, my purpose um, in writing the book was just that I was such an, I was so anti any of these, I was so anti spirituality and religion and stuff. But what happened was I had a series of like life events that caused me to like fall into an existential crisis basically. Um, mm. And then I, you know, you, and I've been writing about this lately and not in other things other than my book, but when you're in crisis, nobody turns to science. Like nobody, <laughs> when you're in the middle of crisis, nobody goes to the science section of a bookstore for comfort. You know, nobody turns on a science video. Like that's the last place anybody would I mean, have comfort. you read the stuff lately? <laughs> yeah. Like nobody it's does not that. easily digestible. <laughs> yeah. So when so when a scientist like myself goes through something like that too, like we're human too. So it's like I I didn't have any answers from science. Like I started asking like what is the purpose of life? Why are we here? Um, you know, I don't know. Are any events fated? Is there such thing as destiny? And so I didn't, um, there's nowhere you could turn to in science for that because they don't even believe in those things. So, but since I'm Persian, as I mentioned in my family, there's a um, tradition of divination, which is you can use anything like tarot cards or tea leaves or, um, I mean, the idea behind it is that the entire universe is kind of holographic and that each piece of the of the universe holds the larger universe and each piece of the larger holds a smaller so that you could in theory use anything to divine. Um, oh, I love it. <laughs> so <laughs> my uh, mother and my grandmother used to do it. Or I mean, my grandmother used to do it. She passed away. My mother still does it. And um, my mom would do it. Like she was known for being very good and she would do it for family friends all the time. So she would read my um, coffee. So it's like a not normal American coffee. It's this thicker um, Armenian, Turkish, uh, Greek coffee that we use where it's that oh, you leave that. the grinds in the cup and you yes. flip it over, let it dry and it makes pictures. And then you have a reader look. So my mom reads that. And so my mom like would read for me for years and I never took it seriously. But then over time I noticed like over a decade, I noticed that, um, you know, a lot of what she said would come true and she was more right than she was wrong. And I could not explain it obviously with science. There was, there's no way because sometimes they would be in advance. So it's like, we think time moves forward. There's no way something from the future could come to the past. So I was like, so that's already out. And then the other thing is that they would be symbolic. Like she would see it was symbolism. Basically it was a language of symbolism where that doesn't work in science either because it's a reductionist um, system. Like we reduce everything to parts like atoms, molecules. Um, so it doesn't um, symbols don't make sense. So I could not explain mm -hmm. it with science, but I knew that it worked and in my time of crisis, um, I, you know, like my mom had foreseen some of these, these life events that happened that spun me into <laughs> despair, really. And so then I, I kind of started to look at, um, like how strange that was. And I'm like, this is so weird that she could see in a coffee grounds, like symbols that tell the story of, you know, 
what happens in my life and ahead of when it happens. And so I just became really interested in that because I guess I was just, you know, looking at the, looking at the, looking at existence, I would say, just looking at the meaning of existence and kind of trying to understand the fabric of the universe. Um, and so that led me into being like, okay, if my mom could do this, can other people do this? Like, I know that Western culture dismisses psychic intuitive abilities, but if my mom can do it, you know, like I'm sure there's other people who can do it. And so that kind of mm -hmm. launched me on this um, curi curiosity journey, really. And um, I didn't expect to write a book. I didn't even expect to change my views, really, because I was very, very stubborn with my views. <laughs> it took me a, it took a lot. Um, but I read a lot. I interviewed a lot of people, and you know, it was a difficult journey because I just kept encountering things that not only personal experience, I definitely had a lot of personal experience like above and beyond what my mom already gave me. But then I started finding that there had been a lot of scientific research, like actual scientific research published in peer reviewed academic journals, um, funded by our government, funded by other governments. So there had been a lot of actual proof um, to the and And since I'm a scientist and know like statistics, and I could read those papers, and analyze them like in a, you know, in a way, like just like I do every day with in my regular work. And I was blown away by it. And so the, and then the amount of like looking into this that I did, um, I became a little like um, confused about why Western culture pretends like this stuff isn't true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I suddenly mm -hmm. was like, and it was, and I was close enough in this point of transformation where I could slip back and forth between old me and new me and be like, you know, no, the brain creates meaning. Um, the meaning isn't actually there. We just create the meaning. Um, we confirmation bias, we look for things we want to be true. And then we ignore the things that we don't want to be true, whatever. Like we have all these things in psychological biases, etc. cetera. Um, but then I would slip back and be like, no, like I mean, the amount of evidence, like using Western scientific methods, um, the amount of when, and when, we like science used to likes to dismiss things as anecdotes. It's actually like a derogatory way to refer to things like, Oh, it's just it sure is. anecdotal. But the thing also with science though, is a lot of good research comes from those anecdotes because anecdotes are case studies in medicine. And that's when you just, that's where you discover interesting things in science. So even though we like to dismiss anecdotes, like when you, but also if you have a thousand anecdotes, they're not anecdotes anymore. <laughs> like it's a, it's a phenomenon. So exactly. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, my amazement, I think with, and then anger, I was, my initial reaction to everything is anger. So then I was angry that I was like, how come people ignore this? Or like, why do, you know, scientists not know about these studies? And why don't we talk about this more? Um, so that's kind of why I wrote the book. And then also because it was really hard for me to switch identities or re release my identity of being um, a smart scientist um, or whatever, all the things I had worked so hard you know, to earn, I felt yeah. like I was, I had to loosen Being duped some or that. something. Yeah. yeah. I, and I had to kind of loosen my um, attachment to that. And that was really hard, obviously, because yeah. identity is everything for humans. So um, I wrote the book to kind of be like, um, everyone, you know, you should look at this evidence that's out there because it's there, which suggests that our models of reality are inaccurate, which means that our science is good, but it's, not great because it's not accounting for everything and we could do better. And then also that um, as I'm asking you to do this, you are going to have personal problems doing it. Like if you're a scientist, it's going to be hard for you because I know because yeah. I went through it. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, like talking them through my thought process and how I eventually. So it's, it's it. written both for, for, um, a reader who may possibly be going through some type, some type of existential crisis, but it's also written for the scientific mind who you're trying to like show them a different world as well. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. And, and, it's, and again, I'm not trying to prove like, um, anything, like I'm not trying to convince anyone to change their mind because, I always, because in order to do that, you have to change your worldview. Like if you're coming from Western culture, like um, our, we call it scientific materialism is the worldview. Mm -hmm. um, I'm asking you to change your worldview. That's a lot. Right. <laughs> That's a right. big ask. 
So it's like, I'm, I'm not asking that, you know, I'm just saying right. that there, I, I think I'm just asking people to be more open and that more to understand. And in the book, I also talk a little bit about science and how we do research and how things get funded <laughs> and why that kind of explains how we don't have all the answers. We like to pretend that we do, but we don't. Um, yeah. And that, yeah, there's a lot to be studied, but we also have no control over what's researched because we don't fund it ourselves. Whoever funds exactly. it. Exactly. I was actually just going to say that. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of, of scientific bias just based on who's funding and what their agenda is. Um, yeah. I mean, so not supposed to be, but right. <laughs> And, yeah. And I don't even mean that. I mean, the government funds the majority, like the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health from the U.S. government fund the majority of science research in the United States. Um, however, they do um, drive research agendas based on, you know, what people think is important, like Alzheimer's disease or um, traumatic right. brain injury or whatnot, which means the last that, thing on their list is psychic yeah. phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. but but they did fund. um but the government did fund a psychic research program for 25 plus years. And I put that in the book and that's what surprised me um, because I was like, Oh, holy shit. They funded this and not only funded the research, they used it in military operations, which they means it was that reliable. It was the ESPs, all that they yeah. sure did. I, I, I wanted to revisit though. Oh, by the way, there's a great question in the chat. Uh, Neon Cicada. I'm going to get to your question in two seconds. Um, but I want to revisit your the existential crisis part, because I feel like this is where everyone is at right now. Like for real, you know, but with the temperature of what's going on in, in our global sphere with global wars, global climate change, global this, global that. Um, I think people are searching for answers. People's identities are being confronted. Um, people's mm -hmm. spiritual practice, scientific understanding is all being put on the table right now. And there's a lot of fear that's like running rampant. And you'll, you're hearing people in the social media sphere, you know, saying words and talking about things that they, a lot of them really don't have the educational scientific background to speak about. So for example, you know, we're, we're sitting here, we're talking about, an existential crisis. We're talking a little bit about your psycho-spiritual crisis and, and, and the research that help you to sort of piece things together, but not everyone has your background. And so I'm, I'm curious to know, you know, just the emotional, the emotional stuff that you went through, like, how could you help someone who's who's really just looking at the world, falling apart around them, questioning themselves and their beliefs, you know, how do you, how do you find comfort? Like, how do you make a step towards just being open to what you found? Mm -hmm. um, how did you do it emotionally? Yeah. Um, actually it happened naturally. And I think okay. that, um, I guess that's a, one, one of the reasons I'm also asking people to be open to this stuff, which again, it's just so funny. It's a complete 180 from who I was before is uh, uh, asking people to be open to spirituality because, and I'm collecting evidence actually. I mean, I put some of it in this book, but the focus wasn't so much in this book. It'll be in a, something, maybe another book, but maybe my, I write a newsletter. So maybe there, but anyway, that spirituality is actually healthy for you. That believing in mm. something greater than yourself and a higher it doesn't even have to be a higher power. You could just believe that life has meaning in some specific way is actually literally healthier for you as in you have better outcomes for chronic long-term illnesses um, and other wow. things like that. So um, if you need a reason, that's one. <laughs> but, that's a reason, yeah. But I, I didn't know that when I when I wrote the book. Uh, I only found those, those papers later. But um, what I will say is I just noticed personally that when I started to open so – let me back up for a second and say, I started, my friends and I started going to intuitives in Los Angeles uh, for readings for fun, just like as a pseudo experiment to be like, Let me, let's get, let's get readings and let's exchange them and see if they're like super vague, like everyone says. And so we did this so like for a bunch of months, maybe even a year, um, a bunch of different times with different readers. And eventually we, we made a lot of observations, but um, one of them was like when they were you know, they weren't 100% right, but a lot of them were extremely intuitive and they would 
know things about your life. There's no way they could know that were extremely specific. <laughs> like they would have seven variables, right? About some obscure like event from your childhood. And you would just be sitting there like, I'm sorry, what? Like, I haven't even thought about this event in 25 <laughs> years. Like, how do you know that? Um, to the point where, again, bringing my statistics, I was like, this can't pass. This cannot be possible. I was like, what are the odds? And so I was like, okay, so psychic uh, phenomena is real. I mean, and then later I went and found the scientific papers that proved it. Okay. But anyway, in addition to the readings, they would, they were, they would talk about a spiritual framework. They would talk about past lives and reincarnation. They would say things like you're here for this reason. Well, they would, sorry, nobody ever said that. Uh, <laughs> I wish, I wish somebody would tell me the reason. But, um, like, what's my purpose? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but they would, they would say things like, uh, you know, like you had to meet this person to learn this lesson, or this is why the situation turned out this way. They were literally giving me reasons, which is funny. Cause it's like, I think subconsciously that's what I was looking for. But, you know, like our Western worldview and science could never give you reasons for, for things never. happening. It's up to you to find meaning. Like, what did I learn from this situation? What did it mean? And so suddenly I was in this strange situation where the psychic is just telling me, this intuitive lady is like, first, first of all, she just blew my mind by knowing things about me no one could know. And, and she did, they didn't have our names. Like, you would walk in, you wouldn't give your name. It's not like they could look you up. It's like, you know, spur of the moment. And she would know all these things. And then she's telling me, oh, and this is karmic and da, da, da. And I remember it went over my head because I didn't believe in reincarnation or karma. Or I didn't even know what those words meant. I was like, whatever, I don't believe in that. Just keep telling me what else you see. But later I started to look into it. And um, like, that's what I write about in the book is a lot of the evidence I found. Like there's a lot of research at the University of Virginia looking into children who remember past lives. Um, and parsing out what's real and what's not. There's a lot of, yeah. So anyway, there's a lot of research I go into into the book, but the point is the spirituality, I was like, this is crazy. Like, cause I'm so scientifically yeah. minded. I'm like, this story is, an, to me, everything's a story. So I'm like, this story is too incredible to believe. I'm like, but like <laughs> the other things they tell me are true, you know, co are coming true. They saw things from my past. So I was like, so what if this story is true. I didn't really believe it, but I was like, hmm, what if? And just that kind of playful attitude of let me just play with the idea in my daily life of what if um, I am here to experience joy? What if I am here to experience relationships? What if everything that happens has meaning behind it? And I just played with that idea and tried to find meaning. Um, and what if I do really have spirit guides? <laughs> like what, if, you know, I just kind of played yeah. with this, which, you know, old me was like, oh my God, I can't even tell you. I would have like kicked my new new me to like out the door if I met her I would have been like get out but um yeah but I opened to it and the and I found it valuable and it significantly improved my life and it significantly improved my psychological well-being it significantly improved yes. my relationships and it significantly improved my existential problem so yes. I was like, at the end of it, I was like, holy shit, like the spirituality is useful. No wonder people use it. <laughs> no wonder people yeah. turn to it because it provides such value in your life and so much, um, not, I could say comfort, but it's not even comfort. It's just like an understanding for um, things that are happening. And, you know, I still go back and forth about whether I believe in that framework or if I believe in other frameworks, like I'm just open now. I read everything and I kind of play with all the different ideas. But I do think one thing I do believe is the universe has meaning. And I think I, it's not a belief. I think that a lot of the evidence that I read proves like or suggests, scientists never say prove, never say yeah. proof or proves. We say the evidence highly, you know, it's highly yeah. likely that or there's a high <laughs> probability. It strongly suggests that, yeah, there might be more. So um, yeah, so I, I think one thing is just encouraging people to, it's very, very um, driven into our minds from Western culture and scientific training, sci scientific materialism, just in our culture to be skeptical and to dismiss these things. You don't even know how hardwired it is for you. Um, and I guess it takes effort to overcome that, but I yeah. think that there's a great value in doing so. So that's another Rate, as yeah, you as you started doing as you were on your journey doing all of this research and you know getting all of these epiphanies and and possibly even sharing it with your colleagues 
did you get any pushback from your colleagues or from your community of neuroscientist big heads? Like, yeah. like, how did you navigate that? You know, like, did they be like, were they like, oh, she's a crockpot, we can't respect her anymore? Or was there, was there somewhat a, you know, just a little bit of an open arms situation? Um, I mean, I think that it makes them, I found that it makes, they all have, <laughs> thing particular things that they're uncomfortable speaking about like whenever psychics or intuitives came up everybody first it was really actually it was a very funny behavioral phenomenon that every <laughs> single person was like well you know there's a lot of frauds and i was like it made me actually curious to be like can someone give me a paper or a statistic <laughs> showing me that the majority of psychic intuitives are frauds because i would like to know where this came from i mm -hmm. like i don't know but i'm sure there are I'm sure maybe some, you know, whatever, but it was funny. That was the initial one, but I found that every single one of them, and I did, I interviewed a lot of my colleagues and I put some of those interviews in the book, but every single one of them had their own unusual experiences, either themselves or people in their lives. So it's like every single one of them um, had something weird and most of them were open to like the idea. They're like, oh yeah, there's so we don't know, you know, anything we don't have we're not close to understanding consciousness. We don't under, we even understand the brain that well. We definitely don't understand Facts. the universe. So they're like, I mean, you know, anything's possible. They were all, they were very curious and open. And I think since I'm, if anyone said anything, it's behind my back, I wouldn't know. And I heard this right, quote right, and right. I love it. It's like other people, um, other people's opinions are none of my business, like their opinions <laughs> of me. So, but I found that, um, I didn't think there were that many of us, but recently I've started to, uh, like I, I went to a neuroscience conference. My, my collaborator, one of my collaborators was like, we should have a neuroscience and spirituality social. And just say, if you ask on the flyer, like if you, have you ever had an experience you couldn't explain with science, you know, come join us. And I was like, no one's going to come, but I was like, whatever it's San Diego. We'll just go for a day. It'll be fine. I was like, maybe one person will come. But like 50 people, 50 scientists <laughs> came from Holy like shit. graduate students, to postdocs to faculty members who knew the entire literature. They knew more literature than I knew, which makes sense because they had many more years to peruse it. Um, but yeah, they all came with um, either curiosity or a lot of knowledge. And they wanted to talk about these things. They wanted to talk about precognitive dreams. They wanted to talk about reincarnation. They wanted to talk about mind versus brain, about universal consciousness. Like, um, And I was really surprised, really surprised by the amount of people interested. Uh, and I think just the level of interest. They, they wanted to form a group. They wanted to keep talking. They wanted to read. So I was blown away. And that is spinning into something larger where putting together like a website with references and we're going to do like a little newsletter to, to like distribute to them some of the things we've read. Um, yeah. And we're, we'll do future events and stuff for them. And we're going to hope, hopefully we'll grow the group, but because yeah. there's, and I hope that eventually it can get out to the public. Cause I would love, 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 love to, to read those, those, that list and, and be a part of that for sure. <laughs> So yeah. we have um, some really great questions in the chat that I would love to pick your brain about if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so the first one comes from Neon Cicada and he wants to know, or uh, they want to know, could people's mirror neurons have something to do with the psycho-spiritual experiences in neurodivergent individuals? So we haven't brought up neurodivergent individuals at all. Um, did you happen to notice anything regarding that within your research? Um, I did not, not in okay. that, um, not in those fields that I was looking at. They seem to be more mainstream versus what I was looking at. <laughs> right. Mainstream. So like even, even the one with the children, with their past lives, um, there wasn't any indication of like any mental health issues with regards to the children or like any uh, issues with being on the spectrum or anything like that. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I can't remember for sure off the top of my head. Um, but the, the, that research was done at the University of Virginia. It's published. There's a few books written on it. It's by um, um, 
oh my goodness, Jim Tucker, I think. And, um, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the other guy, but you can find it easily. Uh, you can find summaries of their research on their website. Um, it's called the division of perceptual studies. So, um, that you can look up. I, I don't want to miss, I don't know their research like inside and out. So I don't want to give a wrong answer on that. Um, but, uh, yeah. So for, for the other types of research, sorry, I'm like going through the different types of my head now. I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, it's all good. So for the, yeah, I think for the psychic phenomena stuff, which is called psi PSI research, when you try to find it, um, I'm pretty sure that they, I mean, usually in research, uh, usually in neuroscience and psychology studies, we do um, screen for mental health conditions or personality traits or or something. So I can't comment. I don't know for sure that all of them screen for all the same things. But yeah, I'm sure that they did. But if you're so usually these people that come in for the study, though, are in normal, I would say, um, mental health, uh, typically. Now, how about you um, in your sort of journey, you know, seeing readers and, you know, just kind of like being playful with this idea. Did you happen to notice like any of the readers um, or, you know, did you happen to notice that there's a particular method that they might use to get themselves into a zone or to get themselves to connect to you? Um, mm -hmm. Like, did yeah. you happen to notice any strange behaviors that you felt were kind of across the board, like something that we had that they had to do or something like that? I think it's different for all of them. Um, I know from the research that I did, like just the reading and also speaking to a lot of intuitives, um, it seems like there's something called um, altered states of consciousness, um, which means so basically like my waking state of awareness is an ordinary state of consciousness. And that's how we normally operate. But, you know, like sleeping, dreaming, the state between sleep and um, being awake is a different state. They're all like different states. Being on a psychedelic, mm -hmm. being in a meditative state, they're all different. So um they say that they're that being in a sort of altered state like meditation um, or hypnagogia um, seems to be how they can get information. I'm trying to think of one of the best nice. words to use. Um, <laughs> how they connect, in their own words, how they connect and how they receive best. But um, this is the other. Th this is not scientific. I mean there's theories there's just theories this is all theories they say that um it's possible because the brain gives off um waves we can measure it with like a, with eeg we can measure the different brain waves so it's kind of like that so sleeping has a signature being awake has a signature and so they're thinking that frequency of um kind of being in more in more of a relaxed state um is hypothesized Right, yeah. it's hypothesized to be um, a state that allows for better access to information, but also it appears that some people, such as people who are highly intuitive, maybe don't need to go into that kind of as deep as a state because they're already operating at some other, some slightly that, higher level or something like that. Yeah. Interesting. And what, you know, that information that they're getting, where are they getting it from? Is it stored within our brain somewhere or are they tapping into some sort of universal brain consciousness? Like how does yeah. that? Well, that is the million dollar question. That is the million dollar <laughs> question. And I think it's true. Like, I think it's one of those things where you're, you're pushing scientists and you're pushing neuroscientists not to scrap the scientific method, but to come up with a new method that incorporates the fact that we're living in a living, in a sentient environment. And yeah. there are, you know what I mean? There's, yeah. And there, there's a lot of different theories um, on how this kind of stuff works. And as I mentioned, they've actually been studying this for over a hundred years and scientists have been on it. Like William James is one of the he should oh, be, yes. a, you know, yeah, like William James should be as famous as Sigmund Freud. Unfortunately, he's not. But like in neuroscience, mm -hmm. he's the godfather of like psychology and neuroscience and kind of. And so, um, you know, like uh, people like I totally lost my train of thought. I was like, I got like so excited about William James. 
<laughs> I love him. And if you want to go on a rant about him, I'm totally okay with that. But no, the, the idea of tapping into either something oh, in the green or something. Yeah, in sorry. Personal. I was going to say a lot of people like William James. Like they used to go to seances. Like they were much more open. They were like, they weren't like, oh, I only do science. They were like, I do science. I want to know what reality is comprised of. And so they would go to seances. They would do um, psychical research um, experiments, like seeing if someone could predict what the next card is that's going to be shown to them or if they can remote view, which is like, you know, see if they can get information from some other a point in different space or time. Um, and so I think that those things, I think that those things are all really important to be open to. Um, and there's a lot of theories already out there. Like a lot of uh, physicists today are working on it. But I don't think we have a final answer. Um, in my book, I put one model I just found in a peer reviewed, it was actually, it was the frontiers in psychology published this. It was like a model about um, how the brain could possibly through um, frequency. And it talks about exactly which parts of the brain um, could synchronize with a field, a field of consciousness. And oh, um, it's difficult for people to, if you hear that for the first time, you're like, what does that even mean? Um, because because we scientific materialism says that matter and physical stuff is the foundation of reality, but that's actually um, not a known fact. It's actually just a theory. And it could be that the foundation of reality is something else like consciousness, which could be a type of energy or a type of information. So there's a lot of possibility that like physicists are working on with neuroscientists. There's a lot of stuff already going on. So it's not like, you know, we we don't have to sit around. We can sit around and hypothesize, but I mean, hopefully we'll we'll come closer to knowing the answer. Like oh in a few decades. I don't know. Maybe never, but who knows? <laughs> It's so, so freaking exciting. And I swear to God, I could talk to you all day about this. Um, and you brought up William James and I just want to kiss you. I love, I love that person. Um, so, love you him. know, I, I, we're getting towards the, the last like, you know, 10 minutes of our life and I definitely, you know, want you to speak directly to the audience if you if you feel comfortable, you know, with regards to just sort of allow, uh, you know, with regards to maybe giving advice to someone who may be picking up your book for the first time, maybe not be as scientifically um literate as as some people are um but just someone who's looking for answers do you have any advice for them on their journey yeah. you guys need to get this oh. so. um, <laughs> thank you yeah i mean i try to um keep the science in the book approachable but if you do if you it, do it is not yeah. like over yeah i tried it, it, but yeah um I, I think just that, I mean, I can only speak from my own experience, I guess. My my biggest problem was that I I couldn't, um, and I for a long time, I couldn't accept that spirituality was valuable, and I couldn't accept that you could be both a scientist and spiritual. Um, and so, you know, that was kind of my biggest um, sticking point was, and also just, just, I don't even know how to explain it in words, but this like resistance to um admitting that things that i considered let's say woo woo which i hate that word but um things that i consider basically uh, you know unconventional <laughs> let's just say mm -hmm. um could be true or could be valuable i had a lot of trouble with that that was like a, a big um like it caused a lot of meltdowns like crying yeah. meltdowns you know <laughs> for me um mm -hmm. and so it took me it's a, a whole while. paradigm shift. Yeah, it's a paradigm shift and it's hard. And I think um, I talk about in the book, though, like it caused me to do a lot of internal reflection, a lot of self-work. And I talk about how I, tr I tried psychedelics and how that fits into all of this. And, um, you know, I did pass life regression. And um, now I'm open to anything like at all, at all, because I think all of it's healing. Um, yes. But coming to realize that like the reason that that was so hard was just because I thought I needed to science to be smart or I needed those credentials to be seen as smart and seen as valuable. And that if I admitted, you know, that I believed in any of the other stuff, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be smart. And it just took a lot mm. of like, um, internal personal development work to be like, it's okay. You're still smart. Yes. <laughs> like it's fine. Yes. And anyone who doesn't think you're smart probably isn't smart themselves because they didn't read everything you read and like, whatever. <laughs> so it took a lot of work and just like, um, 
I mean, that's okay, but that's, yeah. and that's good. Like in the long run, that's like a great thing. Like I'm so much happier now because I did that. So that if you come yeah. up against that in your journey, just, just, I mean, easier said than done, just flow with it and just go just into flow it. with it. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, like for you in particular, and I mean, for anyone, like your personal journey, your personal story, your the consequence of that is that you are inadvertently making the bridge between science and spirituality digestible and accessible to people. And that is just a natural consequence of your journey. And so if if people were to approach it from that perspective of like, look, you just simply walking your path, you have no idea, but you could be helping someone else by you just simply walking your path with all the questions, with all the doubts, you right. saying to yourself, you know what, maybe I'll find an answer my way. You pursuing that helps somebody. And in your particular case, it's going to be helping a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I you love know? it. I love that. I love that you said that. I've heard that a lot of times before. And I love it every time I hear it because it's so true. You really never know. And I, yeah, I really never thought... Um, but I, I, a lot of scientists have emailed me to, to, you know, be like, oh, I finally have someone I can talk to about these experiences that I've had. And it, and they're so relieved, you know, and it's like this yes. really beautiful moment of human connection. And, you know, it feels good to be able to provide them that because, you know, other scientists did that for me when I was going through it. So, uh, yeah, I think it's hard. I think all of it's hard, but <laughs> I think it's totally worth it. You know, it's totally worth it. <laughs> totally is. Yeah. Oh, and I just want to comment on one more thing that you said, which is, um, I think that it's a false dichotomy, um, to say science and spirituality or to look at spiritual stuff and to say that, um, it's unscientific. So that's something else I found. That's something I believe beforehand and something I found in that it's not. And if it's one universe, there's no way that they would be separate. So right. I think, um, I think that's part of what I was looking for in the journey and I found it. And of course there are some things, I think that if you want, you know, the, the, the story or the narrative that works for you, I think that's going to be based on faith. Like you're just going to yes. have to, because there's a lot of different stories like our narratives that are coming mm -hmm. out of the, even the evidence, but just the fact that there's something more or that there's unusual phenomena that doesn't fit our physicalist like worldview. Um, I think mm -hmm. that, you know, we can, we can use the scientific method to investigate these kind of spiritual phenomena. So yeah, I think that was a good thing for me too, is they're not separate. They're actually, you know, if we would just, it, the, the only thing that's separate is them in our minds, <laughs> but if we right. just, you know, reframe the way we think about it, then it's not separate. I love it. I love it because what, you know, ultimately what you're saying is like it, it, this, this, this spiritual journey that we are, we are all on you're right. It's super individualistic. It's super like, it's a beautiful, it's like your own little bubble of just magical stuff. But at the same time, it becomes a communal universal thing when we express it through the language of math and science, because now it's a language that everyone understands. So that yeah. super duper personal moving experience can now be expressed. And we, we, as you know, you as scientists and your community as scientists just simply need to find that method to be able to quantify it, to be able to express it the right way. And like you said, like they're on it, they're doing their thing, the quantum physicists, the scientists, the neuroscientists, right. they're all collaborating and doing their thing. So it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think so. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. we just need to <laughs> we need to get more people on board. We do. You got a lot of work to do, girl. You got a lot of work to do. <laughs> but I'm here to support and any okay. new book that you come out with, I hope you do come on the show again and talk about it some more cuz this uh, for the first time I kind of wish that my live was 2 hours instead of 1 cuz these kinds of conversations are just so unbelievably fascinating. Um Neon I love I having one more too. question yeah. for you. Um it says he says uh they say that um they feel like their sensory processing disorder um hold on, I can't see it for someone, influences the way that they take in and process information, um, which in some cases kind of almost seems like it's psychic. I That's interesting because um, I've heard 
that take too. Now, I don't know that from a scientific standpoint, but I've heard it in terms of like, um, like, for example, like when someone uh, it sees the number three, they smell an orange or when they see the color purple, they taste something. So like some of their cross right. sensory stuff. So like all these various different ways in which we perceive and process our information, there are some people, especially people on the spectrum who can process a lot faster and oftentimes gets overstimulated and over um, worked. And it can almost feel like it's psychic in nature, you know, to be able to cold read right. someone, for example, you know, you look at someone, mm -hmm. you can see their micro movements. If you're someone who is neurodivergent, who can process that information really quickly, and then you can say yeah. that to someone, it almost looks like you have like magical abilities. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and that's, that's, so that kind of research hasn't been done, I, um, that level, Ooh. which is, but we need that kind of research, right? But, and it's absolutely right. Um, and the reason you need lab research is because of this, because it is anecdotally hard for us to assess ourselves or even to assess each other, um, you know, without like standardized validated tools. So you do need, especially for, um, you know, for psychic phenomena or psi phenomena, there are really well established protocols that control for a lot of this kind of stuff. And um, that's why they have the element of time in there to prove that it's like, you know, um, you're getting something ahead of you're getting information you couldn't have had access to under normal circumstances. And inviting that element of time guarantees that. Um, but yeah, but yes, yeah, so whether it's and and psychic like we don't even know how it works we don't know if yeah. it's coming if it's coming through the brain um which it i mean it, it most likely is but if it's coming through the brain where's processing it um and yeah what is different between that and just somebody who can yeah is very uh, intuitive in other ways like i use the word intuitive to mean psychic in my book but yeah. what you can use intuitive outside of that context just to mean like it's somebody who can take in a lot of information and your brain can process it really quickly right and and that doesn't have to be uh, paranormal. Um, right. So I think that they're separate things. Um, but yeah, how separate or what are the mechanisms that differentiate them? That research hasn't been done. So and, you know, we're at the frontier, you know, there's so many there's, you know, this is a pioneering, you know, kind of uh, fringe subject that I think is so important to know. And, and yeah, you're right. Like, it, it, this idea of processing information quickly can be looked at as paranormal, or maybe, spiritual stuff isn't as supernatural as we think it is like maybe it is just very natural we just haven't figured out how to quantify it yet um yeah. you know what i mean so the, the 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 ball is anywhere it's in everyone's court <laughs> yeah i mean i definitely think it is natural like i don't think there's anything weird about it except again what we create in our minds as being this is normal and that's not normal so right. i mean i think that um there's another great um scientist who talks about this gary nolan at stanford he has great talks about some of this stuff and um and a lot of um scientists have written about like there probably was an evolutionary purpose for psychic abilities and perhaps just over time we've kind of drowned those out but they may still there's they're still there in people we just don't use it as much because we have other forms of obtaining information there's a lot of that kind of evolutionary so biology much. thinking on it um mm -hmm. i'm definitely not an expert in that i didn't read all those theories i just know they exist yeah. so yeah yeah so i mean to the viewers you know have fun go hard and research this stuff because it's true it's in all the fields like when we like you just brought up biology you know they talked about how for example uh many of the indigenous guinea people um in australia um have this strange ability because they live in the jungles they have this ability to see things like the you know like when you walk into a jungle your depth perception is shot you don't know how close or how far away something is and you know you're very susceptible to like snakes and, and animals that are in there but there's something special about the cornea about the eyes of these particular jungle mm. individuals and if they were to be put into a city environment, taken out of the jungle and put into a city environment, their biology that they adapted to in that space might look like a supernatural ability in a city environment where it's natural where they are. So it just goes to show like, you know, you're right. It might have been an evolutionary thing in the yeah. past 
to survive. Um, actually, it's it's not. I just thought of something. Maybe somebody wants to read um, this. Um, sorry, it's not only um, uh, specific to humans. Um, there's also been some research done by Rupert Sheldrake, who is an excellent biologist, but has um, actually done studies uh, on this. And he's done studies like with people's pets. Um, Shut up. They're, they're really, really well designed. Like, I'm serious. These are good. It's good research. I mean, you should look. He, I think he went to Oxford. Like, he's super brilliant. And he writes very well and very easy. And he's written many books. So, um, yeah, he's done some studies looking at, um, you know, if he's in a couple. Um, and the one with animals is, you know, like, it, I think testing if um, they, like a dog or a cat knows when the owner is coming home. So they would, they like oh, define yeah. some way to measure the animal's behavior, like coming to the door and um, would record it and then would have the owner come home at like unpredictable times um, of the day. And they found that like there were above chance levels, the animals would come to the door before the owner came home. So, you know, nice. suggesting there could be some sort of connection. Um, and he did this with humans too, like um, when between calls, like calls and texts, like to see if they could guess who was ca um, correctly calling or texting them before they looked at it, like, and if they knew when it was going to happen. So there's been a lot of kind of fun research like that. Oh, so much, so much fun. Uh, Melissa Marin. She wants to know what everybody wants to know, girl. Where can we find you? How can we get a hold of you? What are your socials, your websites, your emails? Tell us. Yes. Um, my website is monasabaniphd.com. And uh, you can, I think everything is linked on there. It should be. I write a newsletter on altered states and psychedelics. And you can sign up for that there. Um, I believe, oh my gosh, I don't even know. I think my Instagram is... Mona Sabani underscore PhD. And then I think my Twitter is just Mona Sabani PhD. Yeah. Right. And I, I will make sure I to put all your Facebook, tags. But I don't really use it. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is. I will definitely make sure to put all of your tags in there for you guys. So um, give me until tomorrow morning when the video uploads. And then I'll make sure to put all that information in there for you guys. We have come to the end of our show. I am so bummed. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, I am super grateful. This was an amazing discussion. And yeah. I think you might have just changed the trajectory of my show um, because the trajectory <laughs> of my show was very much just 100% spiritual stuff that affects the BIPOC community. But you know, my love for psychology and neuroscience mm. and all that, you might have just said, you know what, Leilani, you need to add more of this onto your show. You should, and I think I'm yeah. <laughs> you should bring some. Yeah. Carl Young, William James. Bring it all in. of them, all of it. You, you definitely, I'm going to email you after the show. And if you can recommend some of your author friends, I would absolutely love to bring them on. Oh, um, sure. Absolutely. That'd be great. <laughs> So a super big thank you to those of you who showed up live tonight. We have uh, a obviously Neon Cicada with your amazing questions, Omira, Melissa, and all the other people who will be watching at home on the replay. Thank you guys so much for stopping by. But most importantly, Mona, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on my show. It was an absolute honor. Thank you so much for having me. It was really fun. All right, guys, every Sunday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, YouTube and Facebook at The Magical Solution. You know exactly where to find me. Like, comment, and share. And don't forget, this is how we grow. Have a good night, everyone. Yay! That was fun. That was fun. You're amazing. That was so much fun. I'm. <laughs>